It's weird. All right. Anyway, intelligent query process. So to give you some background, this feature was added in SQL Server 2017, and then it's been enhanced in 2019 as well. So I'm going to talk first about the 2017 features and then the 2019. It's all part of a growing set of features and options in SQL Server designed to make your query processing more predictable and give us fewer surprises from the query optimizer. By the way, this is a little bit of a deep dive, so I will be talking about query optimizer concepts with the assumption that you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please do shout in chat, because then at least I can sort out the misunderstandings. All right, so straight into this. We have a few problems when it comes to query execution, specifically um, problems deriving from query optimization. When they come from fundamental properties of the optimizer, the fundamental way it's written. So the first problem that we have is that incorrect row estimations cause bad performance. The optimizer, when it gets a query to, ex to be executed, has to, op sorry, has to estimate how many rows will be affected by each operator in that plan. It's got to, well, as it's generating the plan, it must know how many rows are going to be affected. But it's got to do this before it runs a query. So it's estimating, and it's estimating based on statistics. The optimizer is really good. And by the way, the part of the optimizer does this is called the cardinality estimator. A lot of people will probably have heard of the cardinality estimator from when the dev team changed it for SQL 2014 and broke a whole pile of queries. And there was no way around that, by the way. They pretty much could not have rewritten the, the cardinality estimator without ruining a few queries because it's just so, so incredibly complicated. But anyway. Bad row estimations cause bad performance, and these row estimations are in both directions, too low or too high. Too low are, are the bigger problem, but too high can also be problematic. The second problem is that multi-statement multi table valued user defined functions, in addition to taking the prize for the longest name in SQL Server, cause problems. Table variables similarly cause bad performance for similar reasons. I'll talk more about functions in a sec, so let me leave that one there. Inadequate memory estimations cause bad performance. Inadequate memory estimations usually come from incorrect row estimations. Gee, I wonder why. Estimations are as well, uh, obviously estimated and can be incredibly wrong. And lastly, scalar functions cause bad performance. If you think I've got a problem with functions, you're right, I do, because they've really got a bad, bad problems. I've seen horrible, horrible performance issues caused by overuse of multi-statement functions and overuse of scalar functions. Um, I have been known to affectionately refer to functions as developer pit traps because the developers run into them so bloody often and don't realize that they've run into a problem. These cause problems because the optimized to execute is a linear process. SQL is a compiled, sorry, SQL is an interpreted language, not compiled. So on every execution, or sorry, on every query execution, we go through pass, bind, optimize, execute as four sequential phases. The optimized phase is when the plan is generated, a plan based on estimates. If the plan is then given to the query execution engine and the query execution engine finds that the estimates are wrong, there is absolutely nothing that can be done about that. If the plan says there will be no more than 10 rows through this operator and the query execution engine is still executing that 10 million rows later, there is nothing it can do. It cannot throw that plan back to the optimizer and say, that was crap, try again. It has to execute it. And since plans are cached and reused, that's even worse. There are recompiles, but those do not happen during execution. They happen before execution, and they only happen for one of two reasons. If the statistics have changed for any of the statistics that were used in the generation of the plan, or the schema has changed, 
Where these happen is after the optimizer has generated a plan or fetched one from cache, before that plan is given to the query execution engine, there's a validation run on it. Have any stats changed since the plan was generated? Have there been any schema changes before this plan, since this plan was generated? If either of those are true, that plan goes back for a recompile. But that is again before the execution engine starts. Once the execution engine starts, it's going and it will not, cannot throw a plan back for recompilation. If anybody is fought with bad parameter sniffing problems, yeah, welcome to half my life. And this is why those happen, because plans are fetched from cache. Plans are optimized and the rows are estimated based on the first execution, whatever parameter values are used in that first execution, and those plans are cached. If those plans are not appropriate to a later execution, well, too bad, they'll still be run. That's not always ideal, but compilation is an expensive process and we don't want to do it a whole bunch of times. So this is a, a very high level look at the optimized execution process. In the optimization phase, we estimate the number of rows that will be affected by every operator in the plan. The query optimizer uses this to generate the plans, to pick the joins, to pick the indexes, to pick the groupings, uh, stream or hash aggregate, to pick all the other aspects of the plan. It uses those row out counts, estimated row counts. The joins are then chosen. Hash joins are great for large row counts. Loop joins are great for small row counts. Merge joins need a sorted, in, sorted input set, which generally doesn't work well on large row counts unless you've got something to leverage the sort of. Um, indexes are great there, but they aren't always available. And finally, the optimizer estimates the memory that will be needed for this query. That's not buffer pool memory, that's what's called workspace memory. That is the memory used for hash joins, hash aggregates, those kind of operators. Once that's done, the execution engine requests the memory and executes the plan. And that happens, by the way, sequentially as well. The query can't start executing until the requested memory has been granted. If the memory request, <coughs> if the memory request is too big, that query can wait a while. Too bad. Once the execution starts, the execution starts. And we've talked about execute plan as well already. Once that starts going, too bad. There's nothing that will stop it. There's no, it won't stop because the row counts are wrong. It won't stop because the memory's wrong. It won't stop because the joins are wrong. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so that's the situation as is. SQL 2017 and 2019 combined, have, have got four solutions for these four problems. And they are adaptive joins to handle the problem of joins been selected based on incorrect row counts. Interleaved execution, which fixes the problem of multi-statement table valued user-defined functions and table variables. Memory grant feedback to fix the problem of incorrect memory grants and inline scalar functions to fix well functions. So let's start with the adaptive joins. By the way, what time do I have until? This is an hour, right? It's an hour, but if you decide to go five or ten minutes over time, that's not that bad. Okay, so I've got roughly until half past seven. Uh, yeah. A little bit more. A little, A bit, little more. bit more. Yeah. Half past seven, quarter to eight. All right, that's fine. I'll just keep an eye on that time. All right, so adaptive joins. When you've got an adaptive join, the decision about the join type that will actually be used to execute the query is not made at compilation time. Instead, it is deferred to execution time, and not just to execution time, but until the first input has been read. Once the first input has been read, we know precisely exactly how many rows will be affected by that join, because we've read the first input and we can see exactly how many rows we read. And the adaptive join will pick one of two 
actual execution time joins. But so below a certain threshold, it will use a loop join, and above a certain threshold, it will use a hash join. What this threshold is, is uh, not documented, subject to change, and you don't try figuring out what it is. It's not actually hard to find out, but as far as I'm aware, it's not documented, and so it is subject to change in CUs or hotfixes and all the like. Sorry, a little bit. Ram, ram, yes. Ram, ram, what's on the desk? All right, so it's going to be fun because she claws at my hands if I'm typing. So this is what an adaptive join looks like in a query plan. It's a join with three inputs, which I should point out, this is the first time I've ever seen one of these. Because for those familiar with query plans, joins have two inputs, the inner and the outer. The inner's at the top, the outer's at the bottom. And you just join those two. If you're joining three tables together, that's two joins, each handling two inputs. But with adaptive joins, we've got three inputs. The first, the one at the top, is that first input. So that is the one that will determine what type of join we get. The next two are ex mutually exclusive. Only one of them will actually execute. They're both in the plan, but at one time, only one of them will run. The top one that you see here, the cluster index scan and the filter, that is the hash join input. If the adaptive join is going to execute as a hash join, that is the input that will run. The bottom one at the cluster index seek is the nested loop input. If the join is chosen to be a nested loop, that one will execute, not the scan. So don't look at these and go, well, clearly I'm scanning my stock table twice. No, I'm not. One or the other, but never both. So let me see if I can conjure up some demos. I'm going to be bouncing backwards and forwards between compact levels. Um, <clears throat> I will probably get this, I will probably mess this up at least once during this session. I usually do, but we'll give it a try. All right, so I've got here, no, not interleaved execution. Here's my adaptive joins. Adaptive joins. So I've got here a function, sorry, a store procedure there, um, which joins together a column store table with the details table. Let's have a look at this. So I'm in compact mode 130. That is SQL 2016. I do not hence have any of my intelligent query processing. All of these features are gated behind the compatibility levels. So it's not enough to have 2017 or 2019. The database has to be in the correct compatibility level for um, the particular features you want. So this is running in 2016 compact mode, so there is no adaptive joins here. You can see here, shipment details by client 56 has got me a nested loop join. And maybe I actually fix this, I can't remember. I just need to about which column, which values should get me a hash join. Okay, excellent. 64 is, this is data skew. Most of my clients have got between uh, 30 and 70 shipments. But number 64 has 7,000. I intentionally did this. This is um, a, not an artifact of the data. This was an intentional change. So this kind of thing works. All right. If I run the store procedure again, you run this again with the same value. So this is 746 rows. 746, not 470. And then if we look at the execution plan, the column store index scan returned 31 rows. Okay, cool, that's fine. 
And then we have index seek on shipment details, which returned 746, was estimated to uh, return 1,078, but that's fine. That's, that's well within the um, safe range for an estimate. A factor of 10 is when you need to start worrying. So I'm going to change that to 64. I've got the same plan because I have not recompiled. That took longer and I've got 187,000 rows. I still have a loop join. I have a still have an index geek, which is estimated to affect 1,078 rows and actually affected 187,000 rows. This is your classic parameter sniffing problem, bad parameter sniffing, bad joins at a larger scale. This is horrendously bad. Uh, HMR turn stats on. This is just how bad this is. Um, so with 56, which is a small number of rows. Hundred and twenty four reads, two hundred and seventy milliseconds, a rounding of CPU time. But with the larger set of data, yeah, you can see it's taking longer. Classic, classic, classic bad parameters. Twenty two thousand pages, hundred and nine milliseconds. This is not, by the way, particularly bad because the row counts actually aren't that high going to the tens or 20 millions, and this goes really, really, really absolutely horrible. And if I recompiled, I would get a plan. In fact, let me do that right now. If I flip the plan, if I toss the plan cache out and then run it with 64 as the starting one, what I will get, if I turn the execution plan on, is a hash join with an index scan. And if I go back to 56, I will still get a hash match with the lower row count. So neither of these plans are ideal because the data just varies too much. So clear the plan cache and toss us up into 150 compact level. That is 2019's compact level. This, by the way, will work on 140, 2017, but I may as well flip tonight to full on 19 because why not? And then I hope and pray this works because this is the optimizer we're talking about. One times adaptive join. All right, so I've got my column store scan at the top again. I've got my index scan here and I've got my index seek. If you hover over the adaptive join, there is an actual join type. There is an estimated join type and an actual join type. In this case, estimated join type was nested loop <coughs> because I created the plan with a low number of rows and the actual join type was nested loop. So if we look over this, no rows were affected. One tool tip. Ah. No rows were affected because that branch of the join was not run. This branch of the join was run and estimated 1,078 rows, actual seven. 146, exactly what we saw last time. The difference is going to be when I change, oh, and 96 reads and 142 milliseconds, no CPU time. Okay, uh, I changed this to 64. That query is fast, fast-ish anyway. I've got 2,000, 3,000 reads, not the 22,000 I had from the bad plan earlier. I've still got 109 milliseconds of CPU time. That's going to be just the hash join. Um, this is not perfect, by the way. This is better. And you can see now that this branch of the join executed, I've got actual number of rows of 187,000 and an estimated of 914,000. A bad overestimate, I should point out but it's still a bad, not that bad. And I can run this backwards and forwards and the join type that I get is the one that will be optimal for that execution. Right. 
So that was adaptive joins requirements. Batch mode. Sorry, um, for those who've got 2017 and don't like column stores, I'm sorry. Most of these only work with batch mode and adaptive joins works with batch mode. That's why I've got a column store as the first input because my entire query is now running in batch mode. Well, this one's actually running in row. Well, I'll talk about that in a sec. So batch mode. Um, the query must be one that can be executed with an indexed nested loop join or hash join. <clears throat> what that means is there must be a index on the inner table such that the join can execute with an index seek. So I need to have an index on the shipment details table on my join column. Because if I don't, I will not get an adaptive join. And the query plan shape must be identical for the two joins, other than the actual joins themselves. So it's it mustn't have <coughs> um, spools or bitmap probes or <coughs> or um, aggregations or key lookups. The two query plans must, other than the join, look identical. You're allowed to have a filter here, but that's it. Right, that is adaptive joins. Do we have any questions? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. There is one actually. Oh, tell um, me what? Yeah. <laughs> the thing is that um, the features that you're discussing now, like adaptive joins, are they available in a standard edition or is it enterprise required? None of these features have an addition requirement. None. I could pull this up in Express. Excellent. However, do note, well, actually, I don't even need to do note. Column stores are required on 2017, but those are not um, gated behind edition, editions any longer. They haven't been since 16 SP2. And in 2019, by the way, the column store requirement goes away. <clears throat> I'll talk about that a bit later as well. But no, right. um, these are not. Actually, let me just check that before I go and make an edit of myself. I'm pretty sure they're not because the way Microsoft's been going recently is gating performance scalability behind the additions, not performance features, mm -hmm. but scalability features. So if you want parallel database recovery, for example, is enterprise edition. Um, online index build is, as far as we're not now, any. Uh, ah, um, Let's go and have a look at the addition features. Additions and supported features, yay. Is this the page I want? Is this this? this is indeed the page I want. All right. Batch mode, oh, sorry, um, I lied. Batch mode, adaptive joins, enterprise edition only, sorry. Mm. Batch mode, memory ground feedback, enterprise edition only. Interleaved execution, all editions. Mm -hmm. Those are the only ones I know of. Um, there's the scale of functions. I, I th think I think scale of functions is is standard. I think that's all editions. It's gone along with the interleaved execution. So uh, I apologize. Um, sorry about that. Batch mode adaptive joins enterprise edition only. All right. Thank you. Whoops. And there I was singing Microsoft's praises. Ah, well. All right, you interleaved execution and deferred compilation, because they are very much the same thing. Oh yes, I should point out one thing. Adaptive joins is not necessarily as good as an optimal nested loop join or an optimal hash join. It's there so that if you've got queries which bounds between the two join types, you're getting a best of both worlds. You're getting something in between, but it's still not as optimal as a query that is just using a nested loop join because that's what it needs. Mostly because that first input is still scanned or see, it doesn't actually matter. That first input is read and cached. Um, so there, are, there is some overhead of this. If you've got a query that doesn't need net adaptive joins, you probably don't want it using adaptive joins. If it's using them, kind of want the ability, the benefit of it because there is a slight overhead. A lot of these, by the way, have slight overheads. 
All right, moving on to interleaved execution. Normally, with a scalar function, sorry, scalar function later, multi-statement table valued user defined function. Don't worry, I won't call it that every time. The way that normally works is that the function executes as part of the query, inserts its data into a table variable, and then that table variable is used in the query. But it's all done in one go. It's all done after the plan leaves the query optimizer, which means the optimizer has sweet, bloody, no idea how many rows are going to come out of that function. One, 10 million, you know, because it hasn't executed it and it can't look into the function to estimate its, the number of rows it's going to return for how it works, unfortunately. It's a separate batch. And this is where that classic 100 row estimate comes from. The new cardinality estimator for table variables estimates 100 rows because, thumb suck, how many rows are in this object that does not exist yet? I have absolutely no idea. Because remember, table variables are batch scoped. They only exist during the batch, and hence they cannot exist before the batch, and hence the optimizer can't get an accurate row count for them because they don't exist before the batch. So it's one of those you know, chicken and egg problems. How many rows are in this object that doesn't exist? A. H, to use a local term. Interleaved execution fixes that by splitting that compile execute process in, into pieces. When there is a multi statement table valued function in the query, the function is executed. As in, the function is parsed, bound, optimized, and executed. The results of that function are put into a table variable. Then, execution flow goes back to the optimizer. The optimizer now knows how many rows the table variable, so it knows how many rows the function will return because the table variable is right there and it's got data in it. So it can actually, there's no estimation about this. How many rows does this table variable contain? Oh, 22,472. Excellent. The outer query is then optimized using the exact number of rows in that table variable, the one that the function inserted data into, because we know how many are in there which means we get a more accurate row estimation for the outer query because we're no longer guessing how many rows come out of this function. This means we don't have any more of those 100 row estimations for the table variable. because we only had those because we didn't know how many rows were in there. So that's multi-statement functions. Multi-statement uh, function interleaved execution is a 2017 feature. 2019 then added in something called deferred compilation. So this case is where you've got a function putting data into a table variable and then that being used in a query, but it didn't solve the problem where there was a table variable that was been populated elsewhere. Deferred compilation does. If a query references a table variable, that query does not get compiled. Instead, the rest of the batch gets compiled. The batch, the plan for the batch gets sent to the, op to the query execution engine. And right before the statement that references the table variable runs, goes back to the optimizer for a deferred compilation, at which point the table variable is populated. We know how many rows are in there. We're not making 100 row table variable estimates anymore. All right, so this, this really doesn't look overly impressive, um, but this is what interleaved execution of a function looks like. So back to Management Studio. I don't need my adaptive joins anymore. Um, before I throw that away, let me just copy this because I may need it. Kill that. Where's my interleaved execution? There is my interleaved execution. No, nope, there is my interleaved execution. And yes, I do need this. Okay, so I've got a function here. This is a multi statement table valued user defined function because it returns shipment totals table, blah, 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 as, and inserts into a table variable. And then I've got a query which uses that function. It's doing an inner join to that function. Why it's doing an inner join and not a cross apply, I'll talk about on the next slide because this is one of the limitations of interleaved execution. So back to compat mode 130 SQL 2016. I run this. Oh, and I, I must say one of the best features from 2017 Create or alter. 
absolutely love that. Anyway, so function. Query that uses the function, I go and pull the actual execution plan and run this thing. It's not very quick. It's not slow. There's not a lot of data in this database. I've got my table valued function there. You know that the table valued function doesn't actually return data. It's in the plan because it's in the plan. But this is the table here that actually returned the results of that function. And if I look at this, I've got an estimated number of rows of 100. Because the optimizer 2016 compact mode had absolutely no clue how many rows we were going to be in this table variable because the function hadn't executed at the point it was compiling. And so it makes an estimate of 100 because any value is equally likely to be wrong. I mean, it could estimate you know, 64 for all I care, but it estimates 100. And um, those, those who remember SQL 2012 and before the old CE used to estimate one, one is also equally likely to be wrong. You, you may as well just estimate anything. Okay, and then I go look at my stats. Not particularly bad. This isn't honestly that bad in terms of estimations. If you do look at this, you'll note that the actual number of rows is 275. 100 to 275, not, not actually bad. If this had 10 million in, it would be a serious problem. But the row estimation does the row estimation error does propagate through the whole plan, and I will actually have estimated rows that are wrong all the way up to the top. This one thought it was getting no, that's a little hard to see sometimes. Yeah, I thought it was getting 2.9 rows, and they actually got 270. That's a bit off more than a bit off. That's quite badly off, to be honest. Right. Let's flip us up to 19 compact level. And back to those. And I can just run this again. By the way, a compact level change clears the plan cache, so I don't need to worry about clearing the plan cache. I hope. This doesn't look any different. Plan honestly doesn't look any different. And just to be paranoid, I'm going to go and clear the plan cache because I'm feeling paranoid. A, a, a compact level change should change the flip clear the plan cache. So there's my function again, nothing to see here. Here's the table that the, the, the plan that the table valued function inserted into. And you'll note that the estimated number of rows to be read is no longer 100. It is 2,627. Because that is how many rows that function returns. So we're no longer making a bad estimate of 100 rows because, well, who, who knows? We've got an actual accurate estimation of the rows in that table variable, the rows returned from that function, and we should have a better row estimate going all the way to the top. Uh, 6.3 to 275, it's better. I've still got estimation problems all over the place here. This isn't perfect. The table variable still has no statistics. It's still bad estimates. It's just less bad than it used to be. It's nice, but if you can get away with not having multi-statement functions, yeah, that's a really good idea as well. This. All right, requirements and limitations. <laughs> Read only only. You can't use this in an update, insert, or delete statement. I'm not entirely sure why, but the interleaved execution does not work in any data modification. And the documentation states that this cannot be used on, a cross, on the inside of a cross apply. At least the documentation stated that the last time I looked at the documentation. The documentation is actually lying here. 
Because this is a case where I've got a function on the inside of a cross apply. And I've just got a simple function that generates me some numbers. If I run this and look at the execution plan, according to the documentation, this cannot use interleaved execution, and so I should have a 100 row estimation of this table, and I do. Should be fine just to run. Or do I? I had a 100 row estimation because the function really was returning 100 rows. A um, little bit of trickery on my part. But this time it's returning 1000 rows and you can see that the estimated number of rows is indeed correct. This is not the 100 row estimation. Lying. The actual requirement is that the number of executions of that function must be deterministic and determinable at optimization time. I can do that here because this cross apply is not changing how many row times that function runs. That function is going to run once because there is nothing in the parameters of this function that come from this table. If, however, I did this, a, let's see, what's in here is an integer. That's an integer. Now, the number of times that this function runs is not deterministic and it is not determinable. It is the number of rows in this table and the optimizer cannot determine that at optimization time because the number of rows in that table might change. And so now I should have, firstly, a different looking plan and a function that should return 100 and it has an estimated row count of 100 rows. This is not using interleaved execution because I've, I've failed this requirement of a deterministic and determinable number of executions. It's not about the cross apply, it's about how many times that function runs. You interleaved execution, but honestly, it looks pretty much the same. It's a table variable with an accurate row count, not the 100 rows. So I'll spare you another demo of pointing at estimated row counts in execution plans. That is interleaved execution. Questions on that? Uh, nope, there is no questions in the chat right now. Oh dear, did I, did I drive everybody to, to drink or to sleep or to no, run away? No, no, they're actually, they're actually pretty quiet, so that means they're interested and following on. Oh, good. All right. Um, interleaved executions, again, it's great, but this isn't perfect. And by the way, the problem that you will get with interleaved execution is a parameter sniffing problem because now the number of rows estimated for that variable is based on the first execution. And if the first execution is not characteristic of the entire workload, you've got bad parameters of it. So this is not a absolute solution to the problem of multi-statement functions. It's a fix, but it's a fix that has more problems than it will cause. So it's not, a, it's not the case that everything is now fantastic and hunky-dory. It's not. It's just slightly better. So do be careful here you're still going to have potential problems around um, parameter stuffing. Of course, maybe adaptive joins will save you there, or maybe not. All right, on to number three, one of my favorites, memory grant feedback. The problem of memory grants is that they have to be determined at optimization time. Again, we need to estimate how much memory this query will require before we start running this query. And if that request is too high, the query hogs resources. I mean, there's a limit to how much workspace memory you have on a server. I think it's 20% of the buffer pool. It can be pretty large size, but it's still not infinite. If a query can't get its memory, it has to wait. It has to wait for that memory before it can start executing. If anybody's seen resource semaphore waits on a workload, 
resource semaphore weights are weights for a memory grant to be granted, are weights for memory to be granted. Um, so queries that request too much memory, you're going to see those resource semaphores because now the queries are waiting for memory. Queries requesting too little memory spilled as empty B. This is really not good because it means instead of caching, working on our hash join or our sort or our hash aggregate in memory, we're writing it to TempDB and reading it back and writing it and reading it back and potentially multiple times. And oh, hell, this is bad. This was also nearly impossible to fix. In 2016 and earlier versions, if you had a problem with bad memory grants, sorry, basically was the answer because there's no hint that says, please give this more memory than you estimate. If you want a particular join, you can hint it. Use a listed loop join here, no matter what. If you want um, more memory, <laughs> too bad. Now, there's some little shenanigans that you could play, and there are some people who have written some really interesting stuff around said shenanigans, but they're complex and they don't always work well. It's usually around tricking the optimizer into thinking there are more rows than there actually are, or tricking it into thinking that the rows are larger than they actually are, both of which will give you a larger memory grant. If you're interested in these kind of weird things, um, have a look at Adam Mechanic stuff. He's got some really fascinating tricks with cross supply that cause the optimizer to, to grant more memory. If, you're, if the problem is too much memory already, yeah, that's even harder to fix. Really, really bloody annoying to fix, I should point out. All right, so what does memory grant feedback do? This is one of the, this is in fact the only of the adaptive, of, of the intelligent query processing features at the moment that doesn't work on a single execution. It works on multiple executions. So if the first execution of the query requests memory that's too high or too low, nothing happens. The query runs as normal, but the memory is adjusted next time it runs. After execution, the query execution engine looks at us and says, I requested 100, I needed 300, put into um, the plan cache that we required more or less memory than we actually got. Plan cache not the query store, not anywhere persisted, it's in the plan cache. The next time that query runs, the memory grant is adjusted based on that feedback. And so the next execution is potentially better, but it's not going to help the first execution. And if you've got stuff that doesn't get cached, it's got recompiles on it, or gets thrown out of cache often, this is not going to help you. It's got to be queries that get cached and stay in cache for a while. So what this looks like, first execution, nice little warning, TempDB, uh, operator used TempDB to spill data during execution. Second execution with no changes doesn't have that warning. So let me see if I can get to work. This one's even more fussy than adaptive joins are, and adaptive joins are kind of fussy. So, ah. Oh, no, no, that's not what I did. That there. Interleaved execution can go. I don't need that. I do need my memory grants. Right. So I've got here for a store procedure. And I'm running it with a really weird parameter. Priority in this particular table is a number between one and three. So if I'm looking for priorities of less than or equal to zero, well, this is going to return no rows returns absolutely no rows. Actually, let me go and flip my version back. So let's go back to 130, so I can show you how this doesn't work in 130. All right, and I've got the little yellow warning triangle on my select. Query memory grant detected excessive grant. Grant size 67 megs used 900K. Yeah, that's a bit excessive. So this particular query estimated that it would need 67 megs of memory to execute, but it actually needed less than one. But then we're on 2016 compact level, so I run this again and nothing's changed. And nothing will change. And this query is using more memory than it should be. So 
back to my setup. Lost the plan cash on this one, but 2019 come back low. All right, so first execution. All right, memory grant detected excessive grant 67 makes requested one used. Yep, that's exactly what we saw last time. Nothing's changed. Warning triangle's gone on the second execution. Memory grant now was two makes. We still only needed one, but we requested two. And now I can run this as many times as I like. That memory grant is not going to change again because it's not considered excessive at this point. All right, so let me change this to a parameter that needs a lot of memory. This will now, this is now every single row in my table. This also is going to take a little while because this is three seconds is a little while. This is turning to 10 dB. And you can see I've got now multiple warnings. They're not on the select operator. They're on the hash and the sort. So the hash use tempdb to spill a data during execution, spill level one and one spilt thread. It wrote 132 pages, that's eight kilobytes in each, and read 132 pages. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, it's not nice. The sort spilt with spill level eight and one spilt thread, it wrote 244 pages to and read the same from tempdb. And this is from a query that returns 34,000 rows. Not ideal. So it got two megs of memory, but it needed a lot more because it had to spill twice to tempdb and write roughly 500 pages into tempdb. So 500 pages, they are eight kilobytes in size. So that's that four megs of the data read and written. Yeah, it's not too bad, but this is a desktop and I'm the only one running queries here. OK, if this was 2016, that would just persist and we'd have a spilling query every single time we run it. 2019, first execution. Warnings are gone. That's impressive. Because last time I did this demo, it took me two executions to actually get the memory ground correct. But this now is only taking one. Neither my sort nor my hash spilt the temp DB. I've got a memory ground of 8.7 megs. So if you remember how this query went, we started with a grant of 67, which was way too high. We adapted that down to two because we were running a query that returned no data. We changed it to priority three, which fetches the entire table. Two is now too small. And so we got spilt threads. And now we've got 8.7 meg memory grant, which is way lower than the initial one, but higher than what we adapted to the first time. And we've got no spills. And we also have a reasonably decent memory grant that's not too big or too small for the query. So that is adaptive memory grants. If I go and clear the plan cache, we start this whole thing over again. Except this time, the 75 meg memory grant is not considered excessive, and so it's not triggering the adaptation. But it's completely forgotten now what the memory grant was. And so, yes, this only works well if you have a query that's running from cache. You notice the uh, memory graph dropped down to nine from the 70. We didn't get a warning of an excessive graph, but the adapt adaptation still actually kicked in. Ooh, that's bad. Oh, not this way. And kicked in too low. Interesting. And back to normal. This time we've dialed in back to 8.7 megs. So yeah, we're back. Um, this one, as I said, it's in cache. So if you've got a lot of cache churn, this is not going to help you very much. You need um, stable queries. All right, so requirements and limitations. This requires either batch mode or 2019. In 2017, this required batch mode, so column stores. 2019 relaxed that requirement. It now runs in row mode in 2019. I should also point out that you can get batch mode in row store, qu row store um, queries in 2019 as well. So we've got the best of all the worlds. The other thing is, the other requirement is that the initial memory estimation must be over or under allocated by 50%. It's not going to adapt 10 or 15%. It's going to adapt fairly high. Um, this one, really nice. The requirements of the plan cache is a bit of a problem because plans get thrown out of cache. 
And if you've got a situation where your query runs sometimes lots of rows, sometimes not a lot of rows, basically a bad parameter sniffing problem, this is going to make that worse because now your memory grad is always trailing the query. So you can actually get into a situation where you don't want this to happen. Um, there are ways to turn it off and dropping down to 2016's compact mode is one way, um, but there are ways to actually turn this off for queries as far as I'm aware. I need to look that up. Uh, but yeah, if you've got particular cases of data, of non-consistent data in your queries, this is actually going to hurt you, not help you. For the most part, this helps. For the most part, this really helps remove TempDB spills. Okay, so memory grant feedback. Questions on that one? Nope, so far, no questions. So we're going good. Uh, no, nah, there is not a hint for that. There's probably a, a trace flag or something. All right, so the last one. Um, we'll try and get through this one reasonably quickly because I'm actually hungry and I need to go cook supper. Scalar functions. I hate scalar functions with a passion. Um, they're lovely and they are really problematic. Actually, I say I hate them. They've been really good in getting me a lot of work because people put them in their systems and don't know why things are slow and call me and say, how do I fix this? And I look at it and go, stupid functions. That'll be three days of consulting. Have a nice day. Um, not quite that bad, but I've had a lot of work for fixing scalar functions problems. Because in 2017 and earlier, scalar functions were not in line. A lot of people thought they were. They're not. You get a function call, a scope change for every single execution of that function, and that function is executed once for every single row of your query. This can get horrible, absolutely, absolutely horrible. I'm just going to go straight to the demo on this one because there's no fun query plans to look at for this. It doesn't actually show up very much in the query plans. All right, so I've got a really, really dead simple function. This does nothing other than strip the time off the date. I could just do a class to date, actually. So these two queries are logically identical. They will return exactly the same results. One assumes that they would return roughly the same, they would execute in roughly the same amount of time. Unfortunately, that assumption is incredibly wrong. So stats time on and run these two queries. That's not too bad. There are 34,000 rows in my transactions table. And this isn't actually too bad, but I've added 100 milliseconds onto the second query. Why? Because of the function calls. No reason other than the function calls. Yeah, and this will be consistent, by the way. The second query will take roughly 100 milliseconds of CPU more than the first one because it's running that query, that, that particular function, 34,000 times. If you don't believe me on that, I have a handy, convenient extended event session somewhere. It's even called scalar functions. You think I might have done this presentation before. So let's run this one and run our two functions, or our two queries. Here, yeah. there you go. 34,431 34, events of the date only function. I mean, it only takes a couple milliseconds to run, but it's running 34,000 times. So that's the pleasure of scalar functions. I have a second one here that I'm almost scared to run. So this is a data accessing scalar function. These things are also not in line, by the way. So I've got a query here that just does this as a subquery. This isn't even a particularly good query. It's, 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 it'll, it'll work. Um, and then the same query with the function. Again, these are logically equivalent and they should run roughly the same time. Um, spoiler, they don't. They don't come anywhere close to it. So, function. No, not that one. Oh, not that one. I said I was going to mess up at least one time tonight. 
These two. Still running. OK, only two seconds. That's not too bad. So that second function ran roughly 30 odd milliseconds and ran 34,000 times. Yeah. I'll show you another problem with this though. So this is the execution characteristics of the first query. And you can see I've done 2,955 2, reads of the shipment details type. Yep, it's not too bad, 200 milliseconds, that's a decent enough query. Here's the problem though. This is why I refer to them as pit traps, because no one can see them. Note that I do not have an entry for the IOs for my shipment details table, because it didn't run in this batch. It ran in another scope, and so I don't have the IOs listed. So anyone looking at this thinks, well, that's fine, because that's only 91 logical reads. I mean, it's actually doing less reads than this particular query. This has got to be fine. No, it's not. I don't I have logical IOs on this particular function, but I can tell you that that thing happens to run. Uh, this particular query. Uh, it's probably doing three or four IOs every time it runs. But this is probably doing three or four times 34,000. This thing's probably reading, oh, where's my calculator gone? It's three, four, four, six. 103,000 reads, those are eight kilobytes in size. Yeah, it's really reading nearly a gig of data that you can't see. Yeah, I love functions, not. 2019 compat level. Thank you, Clever Bank Ash, as well, for the fun of it. Oh, I should have actually cleared this. Clear data. We do that again. So, firstly, zero milliseconds execution time, CPU time. Uh, elapsed time is the time, includes the time for 68,000 rows to be displayed by management studio, so there will be SKUs in that. Zero milliseconds of CPU time. How many times did that function execute? It didn't, because it's now running in line. This one. My shipment details table is back in my IO results. I can see it, and I've got roughly the same CPU time on each one, 280, 230 milliseconds. Um, this has got a lot of reads, though. And if you look at this, 2,900 logical reads of shipment details, 112,000 reads of shipment details. The inlining is not as efficient as not having the function there at all. I mean, these two queries are equivalent, but the reads they did are very, very different. But this is way better than what we had in 2017 and earlier. All right, so the requirements and limitations. Yeah, um, on that point. So the require inline scalar functions in SQL Server. Where's my list of requirements? Blah, 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 blah. All right, so the list of requirements starts here and continues. It's, um, I thought nested um, indexed views had a lot of requirements. And nested views don't have anything close to this. You'll also note here, added in CU2, added in CU4, added in CU5, added in CU6. There are fixes to this been added in every single CU. Yeah, um, yeah, it's fun and games. Most functions will inline, and most functions will be faster inline than normal. That doesn't mean they all will work. There are ways to turn it off. You can disable it on a query level, you can disable it on a database level. 
again, not as efficient as if the, fun the function wasn't there, but a hell of a lot better than 2017 scalar functions. Um, that is, I think that, yep, that is that. So that's the adaptive query, um, sorry, intelligent query processing. It used to be called adaptive query plans. They've changed its name again. So intelligent query processing in SQL Server 2017 and 2019. Are there any questions on anything related to this presentation? Yeah, so there is no question in the chat, but I do I do have one. Okay. So be because of Adaptive Jones in 2017, that they have a requirement for um, column store indexes, batch mode. Batch mode, yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that you, out in the wild, you pretty much only see them in, in data warehousing analytics no. scenarios? No? No. Okay. No, because that you're assuming the column stores are only useful in analytics workloads. Yeah, most they're, of the time. Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah. So no, they're not only useful in uh, data warehouse loads. That is where they're generally used. But I've started using column stores, clustered column stores, in OLTP situations. To be honest, not on tables that get changed all the damn time, but history tables, stuff like that. I've started using them in OLTP systems. Oh, and then obviously in 19, you can get batch mode on row store indexes, so that requirement's gone away completely. No, no, seriously, try out your column stores. When you're doing index tuning, try out a column store. They're actually surprisingly efficient. That compression is phenomenal, yeah. and that compression often 